The Idris Shah Foundation presents Oriental Magic by Idris Shah. Additional research, verification, and unpublished materials by Richard Drobot, John Grant, Ibrahim Yusuf Musa, Morag Murray, Amina Ali Shah. First published, 1956. Entire original text, 1968. And published in this edition, 2016. This audiobook is narrated by David Alt. Oriental Magic This important research text is described by Professor Louis Morin, director of the École d'Anthropologie, as a serious contribution to the knowledge of magic. Following its original publication in 1956, it was translated and achieved a wide general sale as well as being regarded as a classic by students of the history and diffusion of ideas. The literary weekly Time and Tide, a rich source of data for psychologists, anthropologists and psychical research workers. The scientific journal Nature, a point of view of which too little has been heard in the past. The religious review Hibbert Journal, illuminating, helpful, stimulating. This edition contains the entire text of the original work. Forward by Dr. Louis Marin, member of the Institut de France, director of the École d'Anthropologie de Paris, deputy president of the International Institute of Anthropology. The organization of the academic disciplines which we in France associate with Descartes has, in the course of the centuries, so developed that today the scientific method permeates every aspect of humane studies. No longer does the scholar faced with some new, strange and hitherto unexplained phenomenon turn away from its study. In our time he takes full account of it, keeping it under observation, in the hope of finding a way of explaining it. Magic is a subject which was long considered to be outside the ambit of academic study, yet it is of importance in the discipline of anthropology. Curiously enough, magic has greatly intrigued ethnographers on account of the strangeness of its practices in all parts of the world, while at the same time it has been frowned upon by them as hardly susceptible to scientific study and as repugnant to religion and the social order. Yet witchcraft used to be widespread in the Western world, and even at the court of Louis XVI and in the age of Voltaire, it has not died out even today. There used to be some confusion of religion and magic, it being thought that the latter was simply a primitive form of religion. We know better now, and can distinguish between religion, which is submission to an almighty creator to whom we raise our prayers, and magic, which consists of rites intended to compel supernatural forces, whatever they may be, to do the sorcerer's bidding. We must admit that almost all the religious ideas of primitive peoples are comprised in magic. This raises another great difficulty for the scholar, for it requires an effort of the imagination to enter into the mentality of primitive peoples who in their ignorance of the workings of nature feel compelled to construct for their own protection a system of magical observances. One must try to discover what primitive peoples are really thinking by observing them directly without allowing one's fancy to run away with itself. However backward the particular people whose magic is under description may seem to be, it will often be noticed that their practices are survivals, sometimes of so distant an origin that the practitioner himself can no longer understand the words he speaks or explain the gestures he performs. A further complication is created by the fact that most magical rites are enshrouded by the reticence of the initiates. The arcana present a particularly difficult obstacle to the researcher when, as is nearly always the case, the magic formulae are in the possession of a hereditary caste of magicians who regard the secrets as their special heritage. 
This leads to the magicians as a body deliberately encouraging the ignorance of their followers, who in their turn fear the anger of the initiates if they should reveal anything. The fact that magical rites resemble each other in all parts of the world leads to the difficult question as to whether they came into existence first in any one place, and if so, by what means, whether by cultural borrowings, by migrations or invasions, they were carried to such distant regions. These are the lines of inquiry which Idris Shah has followed in dealing with Oriental magic. Of Afghan origin, he spent five years studying his subject in the Middle and Far East. His book is a serious contribution to knowledge and deserves to find a wide audience of educated readers. Preface The Diffusion of Magic it is only as recently as Victorian times that archaeological science has established the remarkable fact that magical origins in High Asia have influenced communities halfway across the world. There is a fascinating story, too, in the westward sweep of the prehistoric Akkadians, the Turanian people who brought Asian ways to the Mediterranean, founding the civilizations of Assyria and Babylonia. Very many of the frightening thaumaturgic rites of the magicians during the development of the pre-Semitic age here are preserved in the Maklu, or burning, tablets, and the vast library of King Asurbani Pal. The type of witch-doctoring, or shamanism, practiced by allied Turanian tribes took root in the East, in China and Japan. These rituals include psychic phenomena familiar to Western mediums, and they are duplicated, again through Turanian Mongolian inspiration, among the Finns, Laps, and even the American Indians of North and South America. Naturally, there is no documentary evidence of the westward drift of these peoples. Painstaking deduction carried out within the confines of a host of sciences has established that there is every likelihood that such migrations did, in fact, take place. It is not, however, only the people of Turanian origins who practice the magical arts of their forebears. As Dr. Schutter and others have shown, in some of the most intriguing of scientific deduction, the prehistoric Scandinavians, for example, inherited a considerable law from these peoples. Another important factor is the discovery that prehistoric communication between peoples was far closer than is generally assumed. It is common to imagine that early societies were more or less independent and developed apart from each other, some in remote mountains, deserts and plains, others in towns and villages. It is not commonly known that in addition to trading, both intellectual and social intercourse between peoples widely separated by culture, speech, and distance, was considerable. The difference between this contact and the relationship between peoples familiar in our day was simply that geographical factors made communication slower. The same considerations probably accounted for greater sympathy between peoples, as there seems to have been less inevitable hostility between different groups. For centuries, perhaps thousands of years, magic flowed slowly but powerfully through the human race. In its most ritualistic form, the flow was distinctly from east to west. At a date allegedly during Old Testament times, after the supposed Turanian migrations, Celtic legend has it that Aryan migrations from Central Asia passed through the present Middle East area and Egypt, certainly imbibing mythology and magic on the way. The ancient Greeks and Romans, too, played their part in adopting Semitic and Egyptian magical law and transmitting it to Europe. Later Latin and Greek magic was a mixture of formulae and incantations, which can often be traced to these roots. The interrelation of the magic of Egypt and the surrounding countries is less clear. It is thought, however, as pointed out later in this book, that Africa and later southern Arabia influenced the miracle makers of the Valley of the Nile. 
With the rise of such comparatively recent systems of thought as Buddhism, Christianity and Islam, the religio-magical beliefs of earlier cults underwent a now familiar relegation. Their deities became inferior spirits. Even their priesthoods took on a more markedly magical and secretive character. Religion may succeed religion, but the change only multiplies the methods by which man seeks to supplement his impotence by obtaining control over supernatural powers, and to guard his weakness by lifting the veil of the future. The secret rites of the superseded faith become the forbidden magic of its successor. Its gods become evil spirits, as the divas and deities of the Beda become the devas and demons of the Avesta, as the bull worship of the early Hebrews became idolatry under the prophets, as the gods of Greece and Rome were malignant devils to the Christian fathers. In some cases, superseded processes lingered on as purely magical rites, tolerated and even adapted to newer cults. Was this because, as some believe, there were secrets known to the older systems which really did produce some strange evidence of supernatural power, which could be harnessed by humanity for its own use? Or, as the alternative contention holds, was it because magic had become so superstitiously rooted in man's mind that the only way to control it was to divert it into legalized channels? Organized religions tended to absorb spells and charms, belief in which was deeply entrenched. Among the southern Sudanese and other Africans, I have myself seen that Christianity has been adopted side by side with traditional magic. Only in rare cases has it supplanted the demons and powers of the supernatural. Often again, miracles related of earlier native sorcerers have been simply brought forward in time and added to the new beliefs. Evidence of this psychology is abundant and has been exhaustively studied elsewhere. Whether we like it or not, magic and religion all over the world are linked as are few other human phenomena. If you believe that, say, cures can be affected by touch, then you are believing in magic by its widest definitions and in some forms of religion. On the other hand, there is a striking development in occultist thinking which can just be discerned today at its inception. This is the third possibility. Magic is a field where intensive and creative study may show that many so-called supernatural powers are in fact reflections of hitherto little understood forces, which may very possibly be harnessed to individual and collective advantage. This is a part of the basis of this book. If there were in reality certain truths known to those nebulously referred to as the ancients, there is only one way to rediscover them, the scientific method. And the scientific method demands the sifting of every fact, every hint, every clue, back along the chain of transmission. In the magical context, this means that we must have at our disposal the actual materials from which Western occultism springs. Hence, a rite which is found in, say, a Latin version of the Key of Solomon may prove to be merely a transcription of some spell designed to combat, perhaps, a flood in Assyria. Further investigation may show that the spell was based upon some entirely irrelevant things such as invoking the name of a supposed genie, whose initials by some happy chance spelt the word for drought, and so the search must go on anew. Whether you are, therefore, a general reader, an anthropologist, or just interested in the occult, here are some of the materials. They are not generally available in any other book. Idris Shah